Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. As together, we look at a few things in Ether chapter 12 through 15 that I hope is a blessing and helps you in your study of the Book of Mormon. Have you ever been on a boat in a storm? Not just any little storm, but a storm where you thought, oh my heavens, this boat may sink. A storm where you think, this is going to be like Gilligan's Island. The USS Minnow is going down, and here I am with Gilligan trying to save the boat. I ask students like students that question or or groups like that one well and some of them don't even know who Gilligan is but it's amazing how many people have been on a boat like that in a storm where they thought ah we're in trouble we have a great conversation about the strength of anchors and what kind of anchor you want because anchors have saved boats for centuries and in modern day there's uh, if you want insurance on some of these boats insurance companies require that you have a storm anchoring plan if there's a major storm, how are you going to anchor it? If there's a hurricane, what are you going to do to anchor it? Because there's a lot of examples of when a plan failed or they had no plan. It's kind of what kind of anchor do you want? Do you want it tossed over into the sand? Do you want it connected to your boat with a rope that may be two decades old? There are some who will have divers that will go down and drill a mooring pin site where they can fastly secure a chain so they know that their boat will be safe in a rather large storm. I realize that some boats have incredibly big anchors and chains that none of us could lift. And that's the type of anchor I want to talk about today. An anchor that's big, that would secure us in any storm. In Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about this type of an anchor, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Now skip that last part of that verse and just do what talks about with Aether chapter 12, verse 4, Whoso believeth in God, might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place in the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith. That hope makes an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them, if you have this type of hope, sure steadfast, abounding in good works, always abounding in good works, not just sometimes abounding in good works, being led not to do your own will, not to get the glory, but to glorify God. As President Uchtdorf has said, hope is a gift of the Spirit. It is a hope that through the atonement of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, we shall be raised unto eternal life, and this because of our faith in the Savior. This kind of hope is both a principal promise as well as a commandment, and as with commandments, we have the responsibility to make it an active part of our lives and overcome the temptation to lose hope. Hope in our Heavenly Father's merciful plan of happiness leads to peace, mercy, rejoicing, and gladness. The hope of salvation is like a protective helmet. It is the foundation of our faith and an anchor to our souls. As you study Ether chapter 12, it's a great opportunity just to ponder and reflect on what the Lord's given you that's going to help hold you securely in place that's like an anchor. You may, if you're in a family group, think of many things the Lord has done for you to hold you securely in place. The promise is, I love the way this is stated in True the Faith, when we have hope, we trust God's promises. We have a quiet assurance that if we do the works of righteousness, we shall receive our reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. The principle of hope extends into the eternities, but it can also sustain you throughout the everyday challenges of life. We all have storms, and life's roughest storms prove the strength of our anchor. And as you study Ether chapter 12, you can also look for things that strengthen your help. What strengthens your hope? What strengthens your faith? What do you do to be like a boat with an anchor, firm and secure, despite the waves and the pressures you face? Because there's times when the waves are so high, we rely on that hope, that hope that comes through Jesus Christ. We need to know that things are going to get better in the storms of our life. One of my favorite quotes from President Holland, or I'm sorry, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland is, every one of us has had times when we need to know things will get better. The Book of Mormon speaks of this as a hope for a better world. For emotional health and spiritual stamina, everyone needs to be able to look forward to some respite to something pleasant and renewing and hopeful, whether that blessing be near at hand 
we're still some distance ahead. It is enough just to know that we can get there, that however measured or far away, there is the promise of good things to come. The hope isn't just of one day when we're back with God that we'll have that hope. We can taste of that hope today because faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because you see not, for you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. President Packer explained that there are two kinds of faith. One of them functions ordinarily in the life of every soul. It is kind of faith born of experience. It gives us certainty that a new day will dawn. It is the kind of faith that relates us with confidence to that which is scheduled to happen. There's another kind of faith, rare indeed. This is the kind of faith that causes things to happen. It is the kind of faith that moves people. It's the kind of faith that sometimes moves things. Few possess it. Elder Packer, many years ago, gave an example of when he had to exercise that faith and what helped him to do it. Maybe it's a little bit long, but I want to share it with you. Hope you don't mind. Elder Packer said, Some years ago, I learned a lesson I shall never forget. I had been called as an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve, and we were to move to Salt Lake City and find an adequate and permanent home. President Henry D. Moyle assigned someone to help us. A home was located that was ideally suited for our needs. Elder Harold B. Lee came and looked it over very carefully, then counseled, By all means, you are to proceed. But there is no way we could proceed. I just completed the coursework on a doctor's degree and was writing the dissertation. With the support of my wife and our eight children, all the resources we gather over the years had been spent on education by borrowing on our insurance, gathering every resource. We could barely get into the house without sufficient left to even make the first monthly payment. Brother Lee insisted, Go ahead. I know it's right. I was in deep turmoil because I'd been counseled to do something I'd never done before, to sign a contract with having the resources to meet the payments. I was still not at peace. Then came the lesson Elder Lee said, Do you know what is wrong with you? You always want to see the end from the beginning. I replied quietly that I wanted to see at least a few steps ahead. He answered by quoting the sixth verse of the twelfth chapter of Ether, Wherefore dispute not, because you see not. For you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. And then he added, My boy, you must learn to walk to the edge of the light, and perhaps a few steps into the darkness, and you will find that the light will appear and move ahead of you. And so it has, but only as we walk to the edge of the light. I am confident that as we move to the edge of the light, like the cloud that led the Israelites, or like the star that led the wise men, the light will move ahead of us, and we can do this work. Ether chapter 12 has many examples of people who did that, who walked to the edge of light. And God showed them a little bit more. A great example really is Ether. He's an example of a prophet who had this type of faith. Uh, Monty Bruff explained kind of how Ether became an inspiration to him when he was a mission president. He said, quote, One sleepless night while serving as a mission president, I was greatly concerned about the condition of the mission. There was need to provide some inspiration and motivation to the missionaries, but I was lost to do or how I might provide it. Again, my thoughts were turned to the prophet Ether because of his example and diligence and inspiration during his missionary experience. I love learning and studying about Ether because of his life demonstrates qualities which I personally desire for myself, such as his supreme ability to concentrate during his service as a missionary. He then quoted Ether chapter 12 verse 2, chapter 13 verse 2, and 13 verse 4, and then added, That night I was impressed that a study of the life of Ether might provide the inspiration which was needed for our mission. Every missionary in the church would do well to emulate this great prophet who understood the rigors of missionary work and performed at such a high level. Ether could not be restrained because of the Spirit of the Lord which was in him, for he did cry into the morning, even at the going down of the sun. As a mission president, I found this example of hard work and diligent effort was among the finest available. We challenged every missionary to learn to be an ether because the Spirit of the Lord could make it possible for each of them not to be restrained. Many of our missionaries had gained this level of spirituality, which could not be restrained, and thus were blessed with faith and results which had not been previously enjoyed. This, of course, resulted in a higher level of work even from early morning till late in the evening. President Oaks, I love this little quote, faith is developed in a setting where we cannot see what lies ahead. 
I have found truly that faith does precede the miracle and that we have to walk a little bit out in the darkness. We have to follow people like Ether who have great faith and that leads us to what lies ahead. Now, Ether in chapter 12 gives one verse that I think is one of the most misquoted verses in all of Scripture. And I've heard it quoted, I give unto men weaknesses, a plural. But please note, I know you know this as you're watching this. It's singular. It's not weaknesses. God doesn't give you a weakness to make you humble. Like, he doesn't make you angry. There's nothing that God's going to say, I'm going to make you angry. I'm not going to make you have a sarcastic tongue. I'm not going to make you be insensitive. So I can humble you, so then you can come to Christ. The weakness he's talking about is the weakness inherent to all of us. It's a weakness that we got to know that we can't save ourselves. When we realize that we can't save ourselves, then we become humble. And then my or God's grace, Christ's grace, is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, so it's that humble, having faith in Christ, our faith in Christ, through Christ, we can do all things. Then will I... God, make weak things, plural, become strong unto us. The lesson is, if we come unto Christ, have faith in him, his grace is sufficient, that will make weak things, plural, become strong. And the next verse, he kind of reiterates that. Behold, I'll show unto the Gentiles their weakness. The weakness, they're hopeless without God. And I'll show unto them that faith, hope, and charity bringeth kind of them unto Christ, unto me. They bring to me, and he's prepared a place that is righteous, that is a place of awesomeness. Really, there is a place that God's prepared. Christ said, John 14, 2, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And Ether talks about that place. He talks about that there's a house that's prepared, a mansion. He uses that word prepared several times. In that place where God is, it's great to see that there's a place of more excellent hope. It's a place, it's an inheritance that you're going to have. It's going to be a place where there's love. You have to develop that to be able to be there. That love is charity. It's a place of, you'll know, grace. It's a place where your garments are made clean, that the weaknesses you've had have been made strong because of the grace of Christ. It is a place where you can sit down a place where Christ has prepared for us to be with him in the mansions of the Father. I just love that ether ties into John 14 too, that there is a place prepared for us, and it's a place of awesomeness. Now I'm switching gears a little bit and thinking of some of the cities of the world. Paris, a city of lights. Cairo is a city of a thousand minaturettes. You have Manila. It's the Pearl of the Orient. Mexico City, it's the city of palaces. You have Rome, which this is just a wonderful city. And in Ether, it's going to talk about two cities. Chapter 13, it talks about Jerusalem and a new Jerusalem. And he testifies that a new Jerusalem will be built upon this land, the American continent. That's what we believe, that there will be new Jerusalem built upon this, the American continent, under the seed of the, a remnant of the seed of Joseph, for which things there has been a type. This place that we built up will become a Zion because the people will be Zion-like. Elder D. Todd Christofferton explained, Zion is Zion because of the character, attributes, and faithfulness of her citizens. Remember, the Lord has called his people Zion because they were of one heart, one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. If we would establish Zion in our homes, branches, wards, and stakes, we must rise to this standard. It will be necessary to become one unified in one, in one heart, one mind. Two, to become individually and collectively a holy people. And three, to take care of the poor and needy. That's the type of Zion or New Jerusalem that Ether is talking about that's going to be established. And Ether lives out his days in a cave. Now, I kind of compare him and Mormon. Mormon lives last part of his days in a time of warfare, but he has status. He is seen as the man. Ether, another prophet, has no status. Chapter 13, verse 13, 
he's esteemed as not as nothing. They throw him out. They cast him out. He has to hide in the day, in the cave, cavity of the cave by day. He doesn't dare go back in. And at night he comes out and views the destruction of his people. The last couple chapters of Ether are a sad reminder of what happens to a people when they reject the light of the gospel and reject the prophets. I love the way Hugh Nibley kind of sums up the whole book of Ether. Ether shows us hum human society divided into two groups. Not the good and the bad as such, but those who have faith and those who do not. They live in totally different worlds. The one group in real heaven, the other in real hell. In no uncertain terms are we shown just what kind of world the faithless make for themselves to live in. This is Moroni's track for our time. You see the results of those who don't have faith. They destroy each other. And those who have faith, they have hope. They have hope for a better world. That's just some ideas as you teach this in your family or, or extended family or in a classroom. There is that idea that because of our faith in Christ, we have the gift of hope. Hope is a gift of the Spirit, one of which we're grateful for and can pray for. An idea for teaching is to focus on what the Lord's given us today to hold us securely in place like an anchor. I think if we make a list, we'll be very, very grateful for what the Lord's done for us and the hope that he's provided us. We could look for examples around us because they're all around us in all of our neighborhoods, all of our wards, in our families who have hope. What gives them hope? How do they get that hope? You can have examples all around you of those who have faith. And I also hope that maybe an idea for teaching I think each one of us has to learn the, the experience, the thing that Elder Packer learned. We must learn to walk to the edge of the light and perhaps a few steps into the darkness. And maybe sometimes it seems to be more than a few steps. Maybe it seems to be like I'm running a marathon in darkness. I think sometimes that's the way we feel. You'll find the light will appear sooner or later and move ahead of you. I know it will. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me. I hope you have a great day. Bye.